It's Shabam, sponsored in part by Google. California health officials announced a quarantine policy for travelers arriving in the state. In our last episode, our Knox virus exploded in Los Angeles. And we saw the public health system go into action. The CDC sent out medical detective teams, instituted a curfew, a curfew. and held some press conferences. It's not an airborne disease. They also closed public facilities. We have chosen to close our schools today. Which means Elliot, Owen and Nadine are headed home early. Can I hang out at your place until my dad gets off work? Sure, we can grab pizza or something. Awareness of the virus is also spreading even faster than the pathogen thanks to the news and social media and YouTube. Spreading explosives. Not surprisingly. I'm kind of freaking out about this whole Knox virus. Everybody in our fictional world is talking about it. I don't really care about some folks. In this episode, we'll look at how our modern communication systems work. And we'll see why the system that we rely on can both help fight the virus and spread it at the same time. Part 1. Mass Communication All organisms communicate, from birds and dolphins to trees and bacteria. A basic characteristic of life is sending and receiving information. Some organisms use sound to send messages, like this nuthatch. That message translates to Look out, a cat. Or this bottlenose dolphin. Blah, 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 give me some fish. (coughs) Hey, hey, hey. Some use visuals. Plants, for example, use brightly colored flowers that tell bees Eat here, it's good food. The bright colors on those poison dart frogs sends the opposite message. Don't eat me, I'm toxic. Many organisms use chemicals to communicate. Bacteria, for example, coordinate using chemical signals release toxins. Even viruses are communicating when they send proteins into a cell to reprogram it. Make more of me. In every case, information sent by one organism is received by another. Humans with their big brains have managed to take communication to the next level. We've built stuff to help us communicate better. Dad? Faster. Dad, can you hear me? And more efficiently. I'll be at Elliot's. You can pick me up when you... I said you can pick me up when... Hello? Dad? Just text him. He doesn't text. He's old school. These kids don't know it, but while this is going on, the CDC is working on isolating the virus. This virus seems to be a bit scarier than we initially... So while public health officials are trying to contain the spread, researchers are trying to figure out how the virus works so they can stop it. As we talked about last episode, any information that helps people protect themselves has to be communicated to the public. Also, any research results that help doctors treat patients to be personal protective should be distributed as fast as possible. Our next piece of equipment. We are now communicating all these various lessons to hospitals, clinics, first responders. So as our epidemic ramps up, it's clear how spreading information is crucial in the fight against not. But there's another way public health agencies use information to fight diseases. And that's looking at messages coming from the public. I knew it! They're monitoring our phone calls! No! And they're watching us in the bathroom! No, they don't! Part of monitoring the media is obviously via the internet. Hey, that's Dr. Khan! Our favorite public health official from Nebraska who used to work at the CDC. We also monitor things such as Google searches. So there's something called Google flu, and we can monitor people asking about flu, and that gives you a sense very early of when flu is increasing in the community. Public health departments and the CDC actually use data from our internet traffic to help them in their medical detective work. In the case of our Knox virus, the CDC would be looking at Google trends from across the country, even across the world. When you have symptoms, you'll often go to Google and search about those symptoms. And this might give people an idea at the CDC whether this is spread outside the LA area. If a group of people, say, in Portland, Oregon, start searching for Knox and headaches and bites at a really high frequency, maybe the virus is spread there. But there's a flip side to all this information sharing. Part two. Miscommunication. All this communication makes it easy for misinformation to spread quickly, too. We're already hearing from all kinds of nut jobs. It's an alien life form that's been frozen. So obviously, the government engineered the virus. And when it comes to controlling epidemics, misinformation can make the problem even worse. Lisa just texted me again about food poisoning. Still don't believe those crazy patients ate poisoned food? Check this 
this out. There's always rumors. <laughs> With another YouTube link I'm not going to watch. Oh, send that to me. She thinks the crazy patients that attack doctors at the hospital had food poisoning? I don't know. She's been going on about contaminated soda all week. She's crazy. This is a great example for these kids because these kids need to be careful that they find the most credible person as their source of information. Because there are also people who don't sound obviously crazy, but are perhaps even more dangerous. Hello, I'm a real doctor, and I have a real all-natural cure to the Knox virus. Order your Knox virus kit today for $19.99. The same thing happened during the 2014 Ebola scare, when the government had to go after charlatans who were peddling fake Ebola cures. Nano silver. There is no other effective solution. The cure is real. During an epidemic where misinformation can actually spread the very disease the public health system is fighting, being able to tell the difference between credible information and misinformation is critical. Just send me money. And the big problem is there's so much information flying around us every day, there's just more and more information to sift through all the time. Part 3. The Digital Age. Is it annoying when two people talk to you at the same time? Absolutely, yes, because you, because you can, can never make sense of both conversations both at the same time. Here's five people talking at the same time. That sounds like Thanksgiving. 30. This is even more annoying than Josh. How dare you? 100. Oh, jeez. That's the show, folks. Enjoy the next 15 minutes of this. There's a lot of conversations going on. That's Tom Sawanabori, the chief technology officer of the Wireless Association, which represents all the wireless companies in America. And we asked him how many people are talking on their phones at the same time at any given moment. Every hour, there's like over 280 million minutes of use going on. What does 280 million minutes of use actually mean, though? Well... We did some calculations and 280 million minutes of usage per hour means at any given moment, there are on average 7 million cell phone conversations going on simultaneously in the US. So while you're going to the bathroom or walking down the street with your friends or eating spaghetti, this is what's happening around you. And that's just the tip of the iceberg because no one just has cell phones that make calls anymore. Oh, mom says, don't pick up pizza, go straight home and eat the frozen pizza. Texting, pictures, videos, it's how we communicate these days. Pizza in freezer has been frozen since Civil War. <laughs> and the technology usually works, so we don't think about how amazing it is. Just like we don't think about how amazing freezers are. They didn't have freezers in uh, the Civil yeah, War. Yeah, Ice was okay. brought by rail car. So cute. That's what they did and though. smart. Let's try and visualize how much information is getting sent back and forth. Dean is coming well, over. After Elliot finishes texting, obviously. And you tell her dad. Okay, we're gonna slow down time a little. We stretched out a second, so it takes five minutes in podcast time. So a housefly that usually flaps its wings 200 times a second sounds like this. I feel like I could get so much more done right now. I feel like I could catch so many more flies right now. We've slowed things down to give you a sense of how many text messages get sent in a tenth of a second. And people aren't just texting, they're tweeting, using the internet to post on Tumblr or Instagram, and yes, sending emails. At this point, 64 pictures have been uploaded to Instagram. There have been 583 tweets, 11,500 text messages, and 58,000 instant messages sent. And that all happened in a tenth of a second, which in real time, lasts about this long. Let's try that again. This long. Uh, you got that? So in a tenth of a second, this, uh, 58,000 instant messages just got sent. This. Uh, it takes an average person two years to do that many texts, okay? So this flow of information, pictures, texts, phone calls, Google searches, videos, is constant and from all over the world in all different languages. And there's all these different machines we have to send this information back and forth, like smartphones and cable boxes and computers. And they're all connected to networks made of cables and other computers connected to other networks. It sounds like a big mess. But it's not. Are you home yet? Still waiting on pizza. 
it's not a mess because all of this information has been digitized, meaning it's been converted into a digital language, which we call binary, but scientists call ones and zero. No, we call it binary. They call it ones and zero oh. because it's a language that's just made up of ones Boop. and zeros. Actually, zeros sound like nothing, but we couldn't just put that, so we put crickets instead. Anyway, once information has been converted into ones and zeros, it's said to be digitally encoded. Every selfie that gets sent, every text message, email, phone call, cable TV show, and grumpy cat meme is information that has been digitally encoded. And anywhere you go, if you're sending or receiving information that's been digitally encoded... Can you turn up the TV a little? You're sending and receiving yeah, okay. millions and millions and millions of ones and zeros. That helped. Even if you're watching the news in Spanish in some random pizza joint in Los Angeles. Going digital is the reason why our communication system can handle so much information. So one of the benefits that we get from the digital encoding and information is the fact that we can communicate much more information than we could before, and we can communicate many more different kinds of information. That's Urbashi Mitra, professor of electrical engineering at the University of Southern California. Taking the original source and converting it to digital allows me to do basically computations with this digital information in a way that I couldn't before. With these computations, it's possible to do things like break up information into smaller chunks, transmit those chunks, and then reassemble them again without errors. Go home now. And that's important, hmm. because there'd be no point in communicating if the message sent didn't match the message received. I'm going to tell mom that I don't understand all caps. <laughs> the magic of converting information into binary, or ones and zero, on. is that you can do stuff to it so you can send it back and forth easier without destroying the information itself. Whoa! Whoa. Hey, isn't that downtown? That's two blocks away from Dad's office. Okay, let's go, people. I'm calling Dad. The ambulance that crashed was transporting a severely infected man, but wasn't properly restrained and attacked the driver. Although it happened on live television, the full story took a few hours to hit the news. Mom, did you see the ambulance crash? Did you talk to Dad? We're leaving now. But we see iPhone footage of that same ambulance crash pop up on YouTube less than 20 minutes after the crash. And some people who witnessed the crash are already tweeting about it. So, given all the ways that we communicate, the amount of information that we send, and the speed at which we send it, this is only possible with digital information. Information that has been converted into ones and zeros. Now, we're going to take a little break, and when we come back, we'll look at how these ones and zeros actually get from one place to another. All my YouTube kings and Snapchat queens are my online heroes. Your hashtag tweets and funny internet memes make me feel so special. I've got 8,000 friends I've never seen. They're just ones and zeros. One, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero. All my heroes are ones and zeros. My friends are not what they seem to be. They're ones and zeros. Zeros. I should accept that I'm finally a ones and zeros. Let me tell you something. Everybody you haven't met in person is ones and zeros, right? Robert De Niro's made of ones and zeros. Joan Miro's made of ones and zeros. Usted que habla conmigo? Okay, we're back. Before the break, we heard about how great digital is. And it is great because without converting to ones and zeros, we couldn't handle the amount of information we send back and forth. But even with all of its possibilities, it's got limitations. We're leaving now. I know, I know, I... When are you guys... Okay, okay, I'll put you on speaker. Since the school day has been cut short, parents and kids are using their phones to coordinate. Hey, Dean. Hi, Mrs. Walker. Hi, hey, I talked to your dad and he knows that you're going to our place, okay? So there's more communication going on than usual. Now I want you three to go straight home, you hear me? No more stopping for food. Okay, we're already walking. And sometimes there's too many people trying to talk at once. Call or text me when you get home. We will. Thanks, Mrs. Walker. And that's one reason that cell phone calls Mom. get dropped randomly. Call failed. Come on, let's go. But what's really going on? That brings us to... Part 4. Taking up space. Okay, here's our constant flow of ones and zeros again. And each one or zero is called a bit, which is short for binary digit. And the problem is that each bit takes up space. Sending video uses more bits than sending audio, like a phone call. 
and sending a phone call uses way more bits than sending a string of characters. How much more? Let's take Nadine's phrase again. Dad, can you hear me? Perfect. Okay. For Nadine to send that question over the cell phone network takes about 90,000 bits. Texting that phrase, which is 21 characters, including spaces, takes just 60 bits. Or this. Yes, this. Incidentally, if instead she had texted Dad, I'm at Elliot's, that would have been the same number of characters, but provided way more useful information. All right, so texts take up less space. And sure, that would have been useful for Nadine's dad when she was trying to contact him, but come on. We want to watch movies and football in HD, enter massive multiplayer gaming environments, and stream live concerts from our cell phones. No one wants to experience Star Wars through texts. Oh my god, he said one of the stormtroopers was shooting. At what? I'll find out. At what? And we keep making more and more stuff. Uh, we are generating a large number of cat videos that take up a lot of space to communicate. So while we're sending each other more cat videos, electrical engineers like Urbashi are working on all kinds of things, like making those cat videos take up less space by compressing the information. Which is totally awesome, right? Because with some electrical engineering magic, we can keep producing more information and sending it wirelessly through the air forever, right? Everyone believes that wireless communication is gonna fix all of the problems that We'll just make everything wireless, but at some point we're going to run out of space because there's just too much information. There's a fundamental limit to what we can send. And this limit can get tested, like in a crisis situation. Earthquake! Call your mom! The networks get totally overloaded when everybody tries to use it at once. Communications that take up less space, like texts, are A, more likely to get through, and B, usually more efficient at communicating vital information. Dear Ernest Hemingway, seeing as how you are a famous writer who is known for having a writing style that uses short sentences and ideas that are clear and concise, what advice do you have for people like me who are caught in a situation that is something like a zombie apocalypse? How do I communicate my need for help in the most efficient way? <laughs> Omit needless words. During disasters like zombie apocalypses, don't call, just text. Text mom. Already on it. Turn on the news. As a fire has engulfed oh. the Alhambra substation, oh my God. to contain the blaze. What is there going on? Other fires okay, so communication is essential to sharing information. And the reason why we can share all this information wirelessly right now is because it's digital, which is awesome. We're gonna take a little break when we come back, we're going to go back in time and hear about a digital wireless message that was sent more than 150 years before we even had computers. Hey, welcome back to another exciting episode of the Claude Shannon Appreciation Game Show called Who's the Father of Information Theory? Is it Claude Shannon? Yes. Round one. Is Claude Shannon the father of information theory? Paul from Minnesota. No. No, sorry. Claude Shannon is the father of information theory because that's the name of the show and because he came up with the idea of digitizing information and converting it to ones and zeros. These are too hard. Join us next time for another exciting episode of Who's the Father of Information Theory? Is it Claude Shannon? Yes. Part five. Digital before digital. <laughs> In this digital age, we've gotten spoiled by this near instantaneous communication. It's not unusual to find out what's going on miles away and send a message to that location instantly and expect a reply within five minutes. Finally. My dad? Everyone's fine. Tell Nadine. Where are they? When do you think you'll... Where would we be without text? Well, the 90s. Okay, let's go back in time. Time. It's 1990! Like, eight people and the military had cell phones. Text messaging wasn't even a concept. Some people used things called pagers. With a Motorola pager, you know now. Mel had one of those. Okay, pager's like a cell phone uh, without the phone. Somebody would call your pager number, and when your pager went off, it would display that number. Then you'd have to find a phone to call them back. The problem is that that phone would be in somebody's house, or it'd be in an office, or it'd be in a booth in the street. How convenient. Let's go back in time even more. Before 1963, there was no touch tone. Phones had rotary dialers, basically a wheel with numbers on it. And every time you dialed, you had to drag the wheel to each number you wanted and let it spin back to its original position. Let's say your number was 954-998-3752. Here's what it sounds like to call that number today. Okay. Here's what it was like if you didn't have touch tone when you had to wait for the dialer to complete every number. Oh my 
God. Skip ahead. Wait. Wait for it. Can you skip? Nope. Gotta wait for it. Now we're state of the art for 1960s. Let's go back some more to a time before radio, before the telegraph, before we even knew what electricity was. Let's go back to the 1770s. Ah, fresh air. No wireless communication whatsoever. At this point in time, if you wanted to send someone a message, you had these options. You could walk over to their house and tell them. You could send them a letter by ship. Or you could send them a letter with a guy on a horse. So walk, ship, or horse. Correct. And walking is slow, and ships need water, so if you wanted to send a message fast over land, your only option was the dude with the horse. In the 1770s in Massachusetts, there were many dudes with horses, and they often carried important messages. Listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere. On the 18th of April, in 75, hardly a man is now alive who remembers that famous day and year. This, of course, is Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's poem about Paul Revere, the most famous horseback messenger in all of American history, delivering the most famous message in American history. The British are coming! Actually, he wouldn't have said the British are coming because at the time, everyone in America thought of themselves as British. He probably would have said the regulars are coming, the regulars being the name of the British soldiers. It's a beautiful story first told to children. Paul Revere hears that the British regulars are coming, he mounts his horse and he rides and notifies all the farmers along the way and rousts them from their sleep and says, The regulars are coming. The regulars are coming. They're going to come. They're going to come. Come and fight them. Come and fight them. And sure enough, they all woke up and grabbed their muskets and went. Ray Raphael is a historian of colonial America. It's a beautiful story, but it's not accurate. He is also a destroyer of comforting historical myths. Because he didn't warm every farmer's farm. He just went to a handful of houses and then rode on, you know. I mean, he wasn't, he wasn't going to stop at every farm, you know. Not only that, but he didn't even wake anybody up. We are led to believe that Paul Revere was the only rider and he woke up everybody. And it was exactly the reverse. Everybody, first of all, was already pretty much awake, and all they needed was a signal about when to start to march. If the fastest form of communication at the time was a dude on a horse, and he hadn't gotten there yet, how did they already know? The first thing to understand is that about seven months earlier, this is September 1774, the people of Massachusetts basically threw all the local British officials out of office. The people of Massachusetts knew the British were going to retaliate. They also knew they had until spring of 1775 to stockpile weapons because no one fought wars in the winter in those days. What they didn't know was when exactly the British were going to start marching. So now it's spring. The British troops are in Boston getting ready to march any day. Now let's put ourselves back to revolutionary times. And it's the dead of night. And if you listen out the window, you don't hear cars. You don't hear that kind of buzzing that you hear mostly today in the 21st century. You know, this... You know what you hear? Nothing. Nothing. Maybe a cricket or something like that. That's about it. Pretty much everybody is asleep at night. And rousing everybody, that takes some time. The people of Massachusetts wanted as much time as possible to get ready to fight, which means they needed a communication system that got the message from Boston to the countryside faster than just one dude on a horse. In 1775, Boston was almost surrounded by water, right where the Charles River empties into the Boston Harbor. So for Paul Revere to get out of Boston on a horse required him to use a boat, which was slow. He said to his friend, If the British march by land or sea from the town tonight, hang a lantern aloft in the belfry arch of the North Church Tower as a signal light. This part's true. They used light signals to get over the water. The number of lanterns signaled whether the British were marching over land or taking a ship. One if by land, and two if by sea. And then what? The message still had to make it through miles and miles of hilly countryside obscured by trees and bushes. So, no direct line of sight. They needed a way to go through the air. What travels through the air? Sound travels through the air. How do people in revolutionary times make sound? They knew how to do that. You ring church bells. That's how they summon people to church. They knew that musket fire, that goes a long way. You can fire muskets as a signal. Bells and gunfire. It was an unmistakable sound during a night that was usually totally quiet. So if there is a distant ringing of a bell, you're going to hear it. And if there are three volleys from a musket, bang, 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 and you have already realized that that is the signal for the British are coming, you are going to hear it. And they did hear it. In this Paul Revere example, 
they're sending digital information because it's either a ringing of a bell or it's not. That's Urbashi Mitra again, our electrical engineer. And it's very hard to make a mistake on that digital information because it's either there or it isn't. And so everyone would hear it, they would hear it with perfect accuracy, and then they would be able to repeat it in the same way. It was actually an ingenious communication system. Churches were spread out enough that you could be too far away to hear the bells from the nearest one, but you could still hear your neighbor's musket fire. When you heard that, you would fire your musket and relay the message to your other neighbor. At some point, the message would make it to the next church, which would ring bells and spread the message further. That's like a colonial wireless network. This network of churches and farmers and townspeople with their muskets behaved very much in the same way that cell phones and base stations and central offices do for us right now. When you send a text from your smartphone, the message goes from your phone to the local cell tower, then gets routed to a central base station or hub, which then figures out the fastest route to the cell tower near the person who's receiving your text. These churches behaved very much like these central hubs. And the reason why you would have to relay signals is for the same kind of reason, that if you rang a bell in one county, it wouldn't be heard in the next county. So farmers with their muskets would repeat the same signal across the countryside from one hub to the other. It's real easy to think of people from the past as dumb because we know things that they didn't know back then. But just because they didn't know about viruses and electricity doesn't mean they weren't great problem solvers. Exactly. Which is another reason why the midnight ride of Paul Revere makes no logical sense. No one in their right mind would entrust a message of that importance to a single guy on a horse, especially if there were British patrols on the roads and that guy might get caught. Like Paul Revere actually did. The British are no fools. They've actually sent officers along the road to intercept messengers. And they do. They actually intercept Paul Revere not once but twice. And the first time, he eludes them. And he manages to get to Lexington. But then he's trying to go to Concord, which is the ultimate destination. And they actually capture him. And they take away his horse. And Paul Revere never reaches Concord. Another rider reaches Concord, but not Paul Revere. So while the lone rider heroically sounding the alarm with a single important message makes a great poem. The people will waken and listen to hear the hurrying hoofbeats of that steed and the midnight message of... It's not what happened. Paul Revere. Paul Revere was an important guy. But there are many unnamed people who worked together and came up with a fantastic way to essentially send a digital message more than 150 years before the invention of digital messages. Part 6. The Big Fat Flaw. Okay, let's go back to the present and see how the kids are doing. See, I told you it works like rabies. Great. We've come to rely on this modern communication system because... Where are they now? Not sure. Getting transportation, see you soon, was the last thing. We use it so much. That was an hour ago. How doesn't he have a car? It's LA! Wednesdays he takes the train with mom. The traffic must be horrible. This is especially apparent in a crisis. I'm trying my dad. I still can't get through. So annoying. The cell phone network, cable, the internet. They keep us informed about the world around us. Is advised to remain indoors. If you Department of Health's designated quarantine Kardashians, latest Wait, quarantine area? What? Owen, oh, switch back. Find our viewers that quarantine does not mean infected. Only... <gasps> Now what? And here's the problem. The power's out and so's the cable. You're kidding. Is that what all this darkness Nadine is? Nadine asked what happened. Shut up, both of you. Ah, electricity. It's what powers our modern communication system. And that's the first thing that's going to go down if you have a disaster. <laughs> Without power, it's like being back in the 1770s. Almost. But that's next time on Shabam. Shabam is produced by Cece Herbert. We need to tell Mom and Dad. I've got no signal now. Neither do I. Your hosts, Mel Herbert, Josh Kurz, and Wendy Roderweiss, also created the show. Don't worry, it'll be fine. Was it? <gasps> Recording engineer mixmaster is Bill Connor. Whoa, the whole block is out now. Our voice actors are Rose Sangenberger, Steve Santucci, Chase Saolinski, Jess Thigpen, Andrew Gallant, Summer Austin, Tim Tui, Seamus O'Hara, Lauren Gribble, Larry Shilkoff, Drew Merriman, and Jason Major. Should we call someone? With what? Oh, right. Special thanks to Dr. Ali Khan, Professor Obashi Mitra, Ray Raphael, and Richard Stern. Relax, it's it's just a power outage. Also featuring the musical stylings of Matt Eccles and St. Cecilia. It'll probably be back up in a few hours. Shabam is a production of Fully Boo Incorporated.
This episode of Shabam is sponsored in part by the making and science team of Google. And why is that, Cece? Because Google loves science.